So Simon Brown here, and I'm doing the Searching for Income webcast this evening for our JSC Power Hour. Traditionally, you know, the, 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 the usual school of thought is that investors looking for income are probably more uh, in the retirement space. They're retired, they've, they've got a portfolio, uh, and now they need to start generating cash from that portfolio to live off. And of course, there will be uh, uh, annuities, living and guaranteed annuities parked aside, and I'm not delving down that route. I'm looking very much at the the, the, the process of, of you know, finding income, but it's not exclusively going to be retirees. And there's a lot of other reasons why you might want a part of your portfolio to be focused on income, whether that be uh, you know to pay school fees, whether it be to perhaps find other investments to then buy into, as the case may be. Maybe it's to take a holiday every year. Income certainly can be an important part of uh, the, the process and, and, and what people are, are, are looking to invest into. Um, there we go. Folks want to show my webcam. We can do that. Webcam should be going through. Uh, there it is. Um, so income is, is, is certainly a, a part of the investment process, regardless of, of who you are. So let's delve into that and, 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 and look at options and you know, the disappearing rates. And it's been a I'll show some graphs in a minute. I mean, it, it, in the US, it's, it's been you know, plus 10 years of low rates. And in fact, we've had a phenomenon uh, over the last sort of four or five years of negative rates at some point uh, to the to the point that there's a Danish bank that has been offering negative rates on home loans. So not just that sort of, you know, government bonds and the like, but actually down at the consumer level where the, the bank was giving a, a, a home loans at negative rates on a home loan, which means that... Uh, Essentially, you're being paid to borrow money in that particular example. But rates have disappeared and, and they've collapsed all over the world. Um, if we look at, at South Africa, this is our repo rate. Prime typically sits uh, at 3% above. So our repo rate at 4% uh, gives us a prime rate of 7%. That is the lowest prime rate that we have had as a country since the mid-70s. So what's the mid 70s? 45 years. This is the lowest rate. So if you are, if you've got debt, this is a wonderful thing. If you owe, have a home loan, or if you are looking to buy a home, you know you're loving the the much cheaper uh, 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 rates here. Um, and in fact, we have seen a fair boom in property in sort of the sub. 1.2, 1.5 million uh, categories. Uh, absolute, uh, you know, even during the pandemic properties have been flying in, in the lower price groups as, as it enables sort of people to come into the market and, and, and actually purchase. Of course, if you're trying to live off it, it's another whole story in of itself. Um, and I remember, you know, the late 80s and those immensely high rates back uh, back then, you know, that was our repo sitting at, 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 at a, you know, I think, I think Prime at that point got as high as 26%. Um, so sitting at seven is absolutely a game changer. But what you note with this is that the trend has been sort of eking downwards. You know, that trough that we see in 2003 was lower than the 98 one. Uh, the 2009 was lower than the 2003. Um, and even responses initially here, yeah, we could see that sort of starting to rise and then sort of came back. And then obviously uh, our MPC got very aggressive this year uh, in dropping rates, uh, you know, two 1% rate cuts, which we haven't seen in, in, in memory and in truth, um, and having implications for those who are looking for yield. And part of the issue is it's around inflation. Now, the, the Stats SA changed their methodology for how they calculate inflation in 2009. So they don't match up. So what I'm not able to do properly is get a sense of, of sort of a longer term. But again, you know, it, the inflation has, 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 our inflation outlook has come down. We haven't been, if we consider that that top level 6% is the upper level of our target. Remember, our, our, our Reserve Bank uh, targets a, a, a range of 3 to 6% for inflation. We haven't breached the upper side of inflation since 2010. Um, so there really has been, and if you're breaching the upper side of inflation, if our inflation was hitting seven or, or, or eight uh, percent, one of the ways that you manage that inflation is you can raise rates. Because what does that do? Well, that then makes people, you know, it, it sort of makes people savers, it makes people spend less and the like. So that will pull back on it. We haven't had that issue in in a decade now, um, and in fact. 
more recently, our, our inflation has actually been popping out the bottom end of the range, sort of sub 3%. There's an interesting point which you will note, as much as the range is 3 to 6%, whenever the governor talks about uh, inflation, he always talks around 4.5%. In other words, he's talking about the mid-level of that range. Now, he's not wrong. But what he's really doing in, in many senses is he's trying to create inflation expectation. And inflation expectation is incredibly important because if you, if inflation, and let's take it to the extreme, if we get deflation, in other words, prices are going down, as we've seen in Japan now for the last 20 odd years, what happens is people stop spending. And the reason they stop spending is why buy something today if in a month or a year you expect it to be cheaper? Now, if we're talking clothing, if we're talking food, well, you're going to buy it regardless because you need it. But if you're talking a bigger ticket item, you're talking a motor vehicle or a white appliance or, or, or a property or something like that, you, know, you start to actually just stop spending. So the governor's been very clever to sort of try and position that sense of inflation at the 4.5% level. And truthfully, that's where we were for much of 2018, 2019. Um, and and it, it, it was working and it creates that expectation in the mind of, of consumers and in the mind of investors at, at, at the same point. So this is a South African picture, you know, lowest rates in 45 years and inflation uh, absolutely on, on, a, on a downward trend. And if we go more global and we look at the US, which is the Fed rate, uh, Fed, the US doesn't really have a prime rate, but certainly there's a Federal Reserve, which is I equivalent of the repo rate, and then different banks will charge different rates. But again, you know, we, we can see where, I remember the, the 90s, where sort of, you know, the five, six, seven, seven and a half percent was absolutely par for the course. Uh, then post the dot-com bursting, uh, we saw Alan Greenspan pull aggressively down uh, rates and then sort of rise them up again. And then, of course, the financial crisis with Ben Bernanke uh, took us down to practically zero. And then they were starting to move them higher again. Um, and then some concerns. And then, of course, what we've seen now with the pandemic in 2020, the U.S. is basically at zero to 0.25 percent, which is essentially free money. Now, typically with rates so low, you would expect inflation. But what we haven't seen in the US is inflation. Yeah, muddling along sort of 2%, which is their, their, what, what the expectation for, for the, their target, the US uh, inflation target is, is 2%. Um, and pretty much, let's say, since 2000, uh, since about 2000, inflation has been more or less at that 2% level. It's dipped under 2004, again, uh, sort of 2008, and it's occasionally dipped a little bit higher. But broadly, it stayed within that zone of the 2% space, which is considering incredibly low interest rates and considering post-2010, or sorry, 2008, 2009 global financial crisis, the amount of quantitative easing uh, in the U.S., you would expect that usually under normal economics, you would expect that to actually create create inflation and push inflation through. However, there's a couple of issues, and I'm not going to go too deep into it, but you know, one is a lot of that money that's been pumped into the system has gone into the stock market, and we could argue that we've had inflation in the stock market. Uh, others would just call it price gains, broadly the same thing, but you know, it, it's sort of you know, splitting hairs as to what they are. What we also haven't seen is medium household uh, uh, income in the U.S. has been pretty much static since the 80s. So houses, households and individuals haven't got richer. And in fact, if we take inflation into account, uh, in some cases, in some states, they're actually poorer. And, and that's another whole story and debate. But that does mean that there hasn't been anything to fuel that inflation. And I didn't go and grab the, the same charts for, for, for you know, other areas. We could go look at Europe. We could look at the UK. We could look at individual company, uh, countries in Europe, such as France, such as Germany. But broadly, the picture remains the same. Two key components, low inflation and low interest rates. And typically, when this has happened in the past, when we've had low inflation or low interest rates, um, it, 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 you know, they, they, they've kind of they're in conflict with each other, and one of them has settled, one of them has has shifted. Uh, either inflation's gone or interest rates have gone higher. But now we're in a, you know, is this the new normal? I don't know. But I mean, look at those spikes in the U.S. inflation when Reagan came into power in in January 1981. I mean, he had inflation of, 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 of almost 14%, um, and he had massively high interest rates to contend with as well. 
and there, there has been a break from the norm, what we would historically expect over the last decade or so. Will that continue for the next decade or so? I don't know. But at this point, something significant has to change for that to sort of that, that relationship, which used to be a counter relationship, to now sort of go back to being a counter relationship as opposed to the current sitting and sort of being in sync. So then what next? Um, we're not seeing inflation, even with that money uh, printing. Uh, I don't think we're going to see rate increases anytime soon. Uh, in the US and Europe, the Bank of England today kept their rate at 0.1%. Uh, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell has talked around keeping rates low through to 2023. And there's one thing if you learn about central bankers, um, when, they, when they say that they will expect to raise rates in two years' time, if anything, typically it takes longer. Locally, our Monetary Policy Committee, the South African Reserve Bank, uh, said that they have ended their easing cycle and the next move will be starting to edge higher and they expect that at the end of 2021. However, the market isn't believing that. In fact, just today, Nedbank put out an, a, a, a note where they say they actually expect um, at the next MPC meeting that we will see another quarter percent cut. Um, in, 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 our, in our repo rate, which will take our prime down to 6.75%. So the short answer is probably lower for longer. And is that longer a couple of years, two to three years? I think absolutely, absolutely. And even when banks around, central banks around the world, including our own central bank, does start to increase uh, interest rates, I think that they, they're going to do it slowly. You know, if we're doing quarter percent increases and we are at seven, how long to get to 10 percent? Um, you know, that, that is going to be that is 12 increases. Now, assuming that they do MPC does a quarter increase every single meeting, that's two years. So if they start at the end of 2021, it's end of it's 20, it's 2024 before our prime rate is back at 10 percent. In other words, even if we start that, 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 that movement and we start moving rates higher locally and globally, it's going to be a very slow process. So you know, if, if you take a sub 10% prime as a low rate, I would say probably you know, at best three years and frankly, maybe five years and maybe longer. And, and you know, maybe there is something that has changed fundamentally. And I, I'm busy trying to put together an article for Fin Week, but it, it yeah, in essence, have has something broken in the last sort of 20 years in our financial system, um, which broken is maybe the wrong word. Has something fundamentally changed in our financial system, which basically says this is it. It's low interest rates for the next, I don't know, one, two, three, four generations. And at the same time, uh, low, low, uh, low inflation. And certainly, you know, medium household income in, the, in America being static uh, for the last 40 years. What it means is for the first time since the history of America, what we have is that the, the children are not richer than their parents. You know, every other generation, the new generation coming through was, was richer than the previous. You know, the kids did better than their parents. And part of that was you know, moving into cities and part of it was technology. Part of it was just medium household in, uh, incomes increasing. That hasn't happened. So there, there might be something there, but it's a it's a question which which I'm struggling to to wrap my uh, the question's easy I'm, it's an answer I'm struggling to wrap my head around um, so where do we find that income you know in in a in a in a low interest rate low inflation environment where do we find income now the one benefit is that low inflation takes some pressure off our, our need for income but truthfully you know I think most of us look at the the stats SA inflation basket and say that's not my inflation basket. Yeah, and, and truthfully, every single person on this webcast today will have a, a different inflation rate, a different inflation basket. Um, medical inflation also is, is typically running 2 to 2.5% two above normal consumer inflation. So consumer inflation is running at 35 Medical inflation could be as high as 7%. Um, and again, as we head into retirement, often our medical requirements are increasing and our medical inflation levels are increasing at the, t at the same rate. So there certainly are, you know, low inflation is, is, is great, but it, it comes with a double-edged sword and that double-edged sword in this case has been lower interest rates. So the classic has been bank deposits. Um, there are some attractive rates there. Most of them are, are around the 5% level, which is slightly ahead of inflation. 
There are tax implications, of course, for earning interest, um, but nothing, you know, nothing absolutely thrilling there. Um, there are some exceptions. You know, uh, African Bank has been offering a good rate. Time Bank, which I know a lot of people have got. Um, but there's also T's and C's. Uh, African Bank, uh, to get the really good rate, they want a fairly uh, long period of, 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 of uh, lock-in. It's not available on call. Uh, Time Bank, it's a capped at 100,000, which for... Yeah, you know, a lot of people, 100,000 is, look, for everybody, 100,000 is a giant amount of money. But uh, if, you, if you're looking to, to live off income, um, you know, Time Bank is great. It's worth having a look at, but there, it's capped at that point. What is important is remember that in South Africa, we have no deposit insurance. In other words, if you have money deposited at a bank and the bank goes bust, legally you have, you know, you have recourse. I mean, you'll be one of the peeps who get paid out. What we have seen from our reserve bank is they have stepped in and and guarantee guaranteed deposits up to a hundred thousand so most recent was vbs uh, which was the mutual bank out of limpopo which went into bankruptcy um, and uh, the process was managed through nedbank but if you had a hundred thousand or less in your account you got that you you, you got paid out if you had more than a hundred thousand you got one hundred thousand paid out now I'm not saying that because I think our banks are, in any case, risky. Um, our banks are incredibly well capitalized um, and, and you know, well ahead of Basel III. Uh, even you know, as we're sitting in the pandemic, as we've seen results coming out to mid-year and year-end in June, uh, most recently Capitec, uh, to their mid-year in August, our banks are incredibly well capitalized. But, you know, things can go wrong. So there, you know, what I'm trying to say here is, is, is be careful of, of finding some bank that no one's ever heard of before because uh, there, there, there's risk with those second and, and th third tier banks. Um, of course, money in a bank deposit has no capital growth. Uh, you, you put your money in, unless you reinvest your interest, you're not getting any any capital growth there, um, and you're just going to get that interest. If you reinvest the interest, there is some benefit to it. But also, from the marketing perspective, watch when they talk about nominal versus effective. Effect, it, it's you know, and I'm not going to name names in, in, in this in this in this webcast, but there's been at least three banks in the last uh, uh, two to three years who have advertised a rate. But when you read the small print, that's not actually the rate that you're getting. Um, so there's a link there to Just One Lap where you can go and, and, and find that. Or, or just go to Just One Lap and search uh, uh, nominal interest um, and, and you'll find it. So, so make sure you understand those, those T's and C's. And of course, there are tax implications. As I said, I'm not going to delve into it, but to quickly touch on it, uh, if you're under 65, your first 23,800 rand of interest is exempt. Um, if you are over 65, your first 34 and a half thousand rand is exempt. Uh, above those exemption levels, interest is added to your income and taxed accordingly. You can, of course, uh, invest uh, via a, a tax-free account, and you can, you know, do a, a, an interest a bank account in essence, a, an interest deposit a deposit account within a tax-free account. But there, you've got your other limits, which is currently thirty-six thousand a year and five hundred thousand a lifetime. So bank deposits are really at the low end, and and. It didn't surprise me when I was putting this presentation together that, truthfully, the bank deposits as a as a generic are actually the 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 least attractive. There are exceptions, you know, as I mentioned, Time Bank and 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 you know, don't be afraid to shop around from the different banks because they will they will change rates as their needs are changing as well. So you know, a bank that might not be offering a good rate today might be offering a better rate. Sometimes there's arbitrage. You know, they'll offer a very good rate maybe on an 88-day deposit or something. Um, and if you can you know, manage that in the process, it might be worth locking your money up for some time. Uh, advance next slide. Um, and then comes duration risk. And what I mean by duration risk, and I mentioned it now, you know, if, if you lock your money in for a period of time, you may miss higher rates that are coming. Now, I don't think we're going to see significantly higher rates over the next couple of years, but half a percent might you know, might be significant. So it really is a case of, and this is a very, very hard decision to make. Um, do you lock in a rate now? If, if rates are going to be falling over the next year, then locking in might be a good idea. But what happens if they rise? Which means you might actually want to take perhaps shorter term if we think that probably we're at the bottom and, and there might be another quarter percent cut, maybe half a percent, but not much more than that, 
but also in some circumstances you'll be able to reset the rate so it might be attractive to maybe get a slightly less good rate right now as we sit here in November uh, 2020 um, but that enables you to perhaps reset to a higher rate in time so the, the, the duration risk is is, is it, it, it cuts both ways. You know, someone who locked in in, in uh, back at the beginning of the year um, is is sitting quite pretty. But of course, you know, because they've got the lock in, but rates have fallen. Of course, the problem with that is quite simple. Um, at some point, the lock in ends, and then you're going to be in, in the new rate environment. But uh, certainly, also consider uh, uh, your own cash flow requirements. You know, if, if this is an emergency fund, for example, and I know a lot of people on the webcast this evening simply have an emergency fund, but they need that money on call. So they need it easily available. So they can't go and look for longer duration. Then there's bonds. I get a lot of questions, people saying, oh, in the slow rate, shouldn't we invest in bonds? And the answer is yes and no. It depends which bonds. So let's first quickly touch on. A bond is essentially a debt instrument. Um, they're going to be issued by governments, by state-owned enterprises, and by corporates. And they need some cash. They issue a bond, and uh, you loan them the cash. They guarantee to pay a certain rate, and then to pay the money back at the maturity of that bond, whenever it might be. Sometimes they're quite short-dated, uh, and then they run quite long. Recently, Argentina, when I say recently, I think it was actually two years ago, Argentina did a 100-year bond. In other words, you will get your money back well, you won't. Somebody will get your money back in 100 years, unless you plan living another 100 years. What I'm talking about here in terms of they issue a bond and they say, this bond, we promise to pay 10% a year every year for 10 years guaranteed, and at the end, you get your money back. That's the primary market. If we're buying bonds uh, via ETFs, which as a, as a South African investor is the route open to us, simply because the bond exchange is, you know, you need to have serious clout to be able to, you know, they trade in nominals of, of a million rand per. Um, in, in, the, in the secondary market, you have risk of capital. You have risk of, 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 of not necessarily getting, get, getting the rate. And that's why bond ETFs, to me, are not massively attractive. Um, a lot of them in, the, in our local market as well, what they've done is they are total return. Uh, the NFGOVI from ABSA, NFGOVI, which has been a total return, uh, next week actually switches to start to pay out. So they will start to pay uh, uh, interest out rather than reinvest it. But you've got real risk of, of capital loss and, and maybe you're comfortable with that but you also because they're constantly changing bonds because you know as bonds are expiring they're having to buy into new bond issuances they're having to create more units so they're having to buy new bond issuances so that the trick with those bond etfs is that your rates are variable and your capital is at risk um, and if you look at the offshore ones your your rates are you know a percent or so and again your capital is, it remains at risk. So then we really want to look at the primary market. So the, the primary market is where that bond is issued. The secondary market is then where they get traded by, you know, bond traders and, and money market funds and everything else. And the primary market in South Africa, we've got the RSA retail government bonds. Um, RSA retail government bonds, there are their current rates. I grabbed that screenshot this afternoon. So that is current for 5 November. Um, those rates from them change monthly. So on the 1st of December, there may or may not be new rates and they may or may not be higher. They were linked essentially to our government bonds, which the government is issuing. Um, but if you lock in, if you go get five years at 7.75%, you will get that 7.75% for five years guaranteed. I managed to pick up some back in April um, at 11.5%. So I am guaranteed an 11.5% uh, 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 interest on that money over a five-year period. Now, there are a couple of important points I want to quickly touch on here. The first is, is that what is your risk here? Well, your risk is, a, is, is risk of default from the South African government. I think that is deeply unlikely for a couple of reasons. First, Man, if you're going to default, do not default to your to your to your to your citizens. Do not default to voters. That is a terrible, terrible idea. Secondly, these are you know rand denominated debt instruments, and typically a government never defaults in 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 the currency in their home currency because they can just go and print more money. Now, of course, if they go print more money, that would in theory be inflationary. Although, as I showed up front. It might not be inflationary, but it could, in theory, be inflationary, uh, and that inflation would then 
lead to higher rates. So, uh, yeah, but anyway, so I, I consider these to be a suitably low enough risk for me. What is important is you're locked in. Now, what that, but what what it says is that, let's say you buy today at 7.75. You take that five year and you take the 7.75 percent, and a year's time it's offering you 10 percent. You can reset to the higher rate, but you also reset to the duration. In other words, your rate will change to whatever that new rate is, but your five-year period would start again when you reset. That makes sense to everybody. So you can reset for that duration, which removes some of that duration risk. If, if rates are falling, no worries. You stay exactly where they are. If rates rise, you can reset to the higher rate. So in fact, you're getting a nice bit of protection there, in a sense, from, 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 from that duration risk. Uh, interest is either paid or reinvested. Uh, they won't reinvest on the inflation link, and I'm going to talk about those in a moment. But if you don't necessarily need the cash, you can have it reinvested on your fixed rate, or you can have it paid out. Uh, the payout is biannual, but if you are over 65, you can get a more freq a higher frequency of payout coming to yourself. The inflation linked, what happens is, is that the capital increases by the CPI, the inflation, twice a year, and then they pay the coupon on that new amount. So you get two levels of growth here. The one is the inflation that you're currently receiving, uh, which will increase the capital value, and then you get paid out, in the case of the 10-year, you get paid out 5%. So if we take inflation at a current 3%, that one's slightly ahead of, the, of, of, of in fact, it's, it's kind of on the nose. The two five-years will come in at 7.5 and 7 three quarter. But that capital appreciation by the inflation rate is attractive because it means that every year your your payout that you receive, that that four and a half or five or three and a half percent, is based on a higher amount as it increases. So these are certainly something worth looking at. Um, as I said, I parked some cash in it back in April. I had some 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 money lying, you know, not lying lazy, but you know, some cash available. Um, and, and at that point, it was an eleven and a half percent. Uh, question coming through, what happens to the interest accumulated once you decide to refix, to reset the fixed rate? Uh, it would remain in. So the accumulated interest, assuming you have been reinvesting that, that, that cash, it would then stay in. You would refix. You've now got, so let's say you put 10,000 in and it grows. You've reinvested the interest. It's now 11,000. Um, and then there's a higher rate. So you reset the rate where well, you've now got 11,000 invested there rather than that, that initial 10. There's another very important point here is that these are fixed term. Now, if you've been in there for one year, you can take the money out early, but you forfeit accrued but unpaid interest. If it has been less than a year, you can request an early uh, withdrawal, but they will have to approve on a case by case. But you know, it, it's a fixed, it's a, essentially a fixed deposit, so that's not unreasonable uh, from Treasury. Uh, there is online, you Google them, the online process works. We did it back in April and it was perfectly sweet. Question coming, can you use these for tax-free accounts? So they say you can, and the Act says that you can, but uh, actually they're not currently enabling it uh, at all. Uh, Adam, get into those in a moment. So money market versus income funds. Um, uh, per annum, yeah. The money market versus income. The first point is I understand the distinction between the two. It's phrases that, that many people, myself include, included, use interchangeably. But actually, these are different products. Money market is very much short-term debt. The, the, by, by the rules of, 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 of uh, uh, the collective investment schemes, money market needs to be short-term debt, limit of 13 months. So it can't be any debt that's more than 13 months and an average maturity not exceeding 90 days. So these rates are going to be very volatile because they're very short term. So as rates are changing, as you'll find different rates changing, uh, you know, prime, et cetera, uh, you will find some significant volatility happening in the money market. Income funds can have longer maturity. What that also means is that they can put in for example, they could put preference shares into there. They can go and find a much longer maturity. For example, they could go and grab that uh, 7.75 and stick it in there. So, Adam, your question is your view of money market funds paying out uh, interest at 7%, or even plus 7%. That's absolutely not impossible. Um, 
but it's not it's not fixed. I mean, you you will find some of those funds that are doing it. They're going to be they they they're going to be uh, over the counter, so it'll be lisps, it'll be unit trusts and the like, um, and they will pay around. You know, a lot of them are sort of at the five and a half, maybe six percent. In my digging, I did see some at the the seven. In fact, I saw one at about seven point six percent. But if rates come down, then these come down at the same time. And I understand that there's risk in this environment. I mean, there's always risk, right? The, the, how do we avoid risk? We put the money under the mattress, and then we have three risks. One, your house burns down. Two, your kids find it. Uh, and three, inflation kills it. But, you know, that's your lowest risk investment. Um, as soon as we start moving in, for example, when African Bank went, bank, went, went bust, uh, some income funds had invested into the African Bank preference shares. And those preference shares became worthless. So investors did you know they 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 got into trouble at at that point it, it was it was very small it was fractions of a percent but it absolutely wasn't there at all uh yeah adam in 2000 in 2008 yeah again in 2008 the, these are holding debt instruments now they will predominantly hold very boring very safe debt instruments they absolutely will you know what i mean by that they'll hold you know government bonds they'll hold uh, money market bills from you know jai bar and stuff they're very very safe but that gives them because of that level of safety it gives you a lower rate so how do you push that rate a little bit higher how do you move from six to six and a half and then to seven and maybe even seven and a half percent well you pick up some slightly higher riskier product in there and that then comes to my next slide. Adam, you're uh, 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 predicting my slides as they come. What's inside matters. And risk is not. Oftentimes, you will find these money market and these income funds, and they will be quoted at average risk. In other words, they'll say the average rating in here is double A plus or whatever the rating might be. And you think, well, that's a really good rating and that's really lacquer. But that's the wrong way of doing it. Because it's not your average that's going to default. It's your lowest quality that's going to default. So what you actually need to get a sense of is what is the lowest quality instrument in this money market or this income fund? Because that's the one. You know, when the when the African bank pref shares defaulted, I mean, they were probably paying around 18%. And I, I'm digging from memory. So if I'm wrong, uh, uh, forgive me. But, you know, they were very attractive. And you could have put those in there and said, well, this fund has an average rating of X. But the African banks were below the average and they defaulted and they sort of lost their value. So it's not about the average quality. It's about the lowest quality. And the problem is, is that, for the average person, we look at that and we don't fully understand what those risks are. And, and I'll throw you an example in a moment. But I look at them and I'm like, yo, I, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know who's the risky one here, how risky they are. So certainly these are an option and certainly they, 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 they can give you a rate. But understand you know, the sense that these are not risk-free and that those money markets are going to be very short-term. So the rates will be volatile. Income funds can go longer maturity, but that can push the risk up in a sense. Um, there is a money market ETF from ABSA. It's the new funds, Tracy. Uh, they're basically investing into three-month money. If you remember the rule, uh, maturity not exceeding 90 days. So they maturity at exactly 90 days. The yield is 6%. It is historic. What's important is they don't pay out. They in they reinvest that cash. So if you look at the chart of the the, the, the Tracy, I call it the Tracy, T R A C I. Um, if you look at the chart of the Tracy, it is just a steady every single day it increases by that interest accrued. And if you want to realize it, you then have to exit and sell it. Um, they don't pay out at all. Six percent historic. It's not bad. It, it's again, it's three month money, so it's going to be it's, it's going to be volatile as those rates come down. Um, and it is counterparty there being absent. Let's look at some other ETFs, and here we're moving, <clears throat> excuse me, now more into the sort of equity space. Satrix Divi Plus, a lot of folks talk about this. So this is, is how does the Satrix Divi, what is their methodology? So they take the 100 biggest shares in the JSC, and they look for, at the forward dividend yield and buy the shares with the best forward dividend yield. And the problem with that is that those dividend yields can collapse, they can change, they can be not so great. So it's not set in stone. This yield on this Divi Plus at times has been quite low. So there's a risk here, not only of capital loss, 
or capital gain. It could go either way. But there's also a risk here of dividend loss. In other words, you buy it because you look at a 4.4% dividend yield and you think, hey, not bad. Um, and you can buy it in a tax-free account. You can also buy the money market ETF in a tax-free account. You could buy this in a tax-free account um, and you can get 4.4% tax-free. It's not the best rate out there, but you've also got potential for capital appreciation. And that looks quite attractive. But the stocks within it might start cancelling dividends. So if you look at the top 10 holdings uh, in that ETF, and this is from the Satrix website, and this will be as of, there it is, end of September. They haven't yet published their MDD minimum disclosure document for end of October. If you look at this, it's MTN, British American, Exara, Nedbank, African Rainbow, Remgro, Absa, Vodacom, Multi-Choice, AVI. I would say Exaro, African Rainbow, and to a lesser degree, AVI, their dividends are not cast in stone. <laughs> Excuse me. So there certainly is some potential here that 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 the dividend could drop off a bit. There is certainly some risk in that space. So, you know, <clears throat> 4.4 is not bad, but appreciate that it might not stay that. And this would be more, I said up front, you know, the keep, usually the people looking for income from investments are people in retirement. They need cash flow to live off. But the second group of people who just like that income coming because it's a holiday or, or because it generates money so you can go buy different assets, different ETFs and the like. That second group, you know, if you don't quite hit your target, well, you can downgrade your holiday, right? You could go to, I don't know, uh, 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 Peter Maritzburg instead of Durban because like, it's closer, so it's less travel or whatever, you know, stuff like that. You, you get less cash, so you buy less ETFs or reinvestments or something like that. So it comes back to assessing that risk. The core share dividend aristocrats. Now, the local one actually has a fairly good yield compared to the offshore, but what's important here and I must stress this, is that they don't take dividend yield as the 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 the, 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 the selection process. They simply use dividend as a quality metric. What I mean by that is on the offshore one, uh, to be a U.S. stock included, you need to have 25 years of dividend paying history, 25 consecutive years. So it's used more as a quality filter. It turns out that the local div tracks, which is uh, the div tracks there, and this is from core shares, um, the local one actually has a, I thought, 5%. I was not expecting that level of, 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 of dividend out of it. Again, African Rainbow, there's some risk to that. My risk on African Rainbow is commodities. Commodity prices go south which would be similar with BHP and with Kumba, uh, the commodity price is under pressure, then those stocks are under pressure and their dividends are under pressure as well. Uh, Distel, JSC, First Rain, Vodacom, Remgro, BTI, uh, those are fairly reliable and, and, and steady dividend payers. And the global one, what you will note is missing from the top 10 holdings, no tech, because you have to have 25 years of historic dividend payments and Facebook didn't exist 25 years ago. Google didn't exist 25 years ago. Amazon did. They weren't paying dividends 25 years ago. So no tech stocks, or very, very few. You know, they've probably maybe got some Microsoft. Maybe they've got some IBM. Um, but they haven't got the high-flying tech stocks. But I would say that local div tracks, again, same story as with Dividend Plus. You've got risk of capital loss. You've got risk of dividend falling. And those are before dividend withholding tax, which obviously slices 20% off that yield. Question coming through, you could do a blend. I mean, you absolutely can. And I think typically, particularly if it's a retirement process and you're doing this for income, I think it is very much a case of doing a blend, of of having some sort of some surety in your your sort of you know, cash holdings, government bonds and the like, the retail bonds, and then a little bit of, of volatility here. And if yields fall, you can tighten your belt a bit. And if yields rise, well, then you're off to the races. Preference shares. So preference shares are debt instruments. They are listed by uh, companies on the JSC, and they then trade on the JSC. Uh, these are perpetual, in other words, they lost. Uh, actually, I was going to say that. Not all of them. Some of them have expiries, such as the Zambezi pref share. Um, they pay a rate that is linked to the prime rate. Um, the, the, the dividends received are uh, 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 taxed as dividend withholding tax. Um, 
And my source here is AfriFocus. And head over to AfriFocus. They do a, a, a monthly report on, on preference shares, um, and you can chat to them there as well. Uh, the, the source is down at the bottom there. You can find out more there. They do a great monthly report on, on preference shares and, and what's happening in, in the market. So this is the one, the most recent one, which I grabbed. They've got the, the, the pre-tax and the post-tax. And here you're looking at 11.6% on an ABSA preference share. Now you sliced your 20% uh, dividend withholding off. And you're still at around about, what's that, 9-ish percent. No, my math is wrong. Uh, yeah, about 9-ish percent. That's after dividend withholding tax. And your risk is ABSA. Now, with respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if you go down, I mean, down here, you've got your Capitex. You've got your Zambezi. Important. The Zambezi pref do not pay out. They automatically appreciate in price. Um, you had a couple, you know, Netcares. I'm not calling them dodgy companies, but Grinrod, uh, 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 the DB, DSB is the discovery, uh, Sasfin. But, you know, you've got to say, Abs is a big four bank in this country and 11.6%. Now, you know, check that yield. It's going to fluctuate. There is risk of capital depreciation because you buy them and the price could go down and they are linked to prime. So if the prime rate falls, that yield will fall at the same time. And this is an historic rate over the last year and of course a year ago interest rates were at a different level so you need to crunch those numbers um they're going to be a little bit lower coming in but preference shares typically for me have not been that massively attractive but at this point in the equation some of these preference shares are looking really really good so and, and if you want more and i mean as i said afrifocus have got some pros there so you could phone up afrifocus you can go have a look at that at, at the research report um, and what they could also do is sort of put together you a, a basket you can also get cunning because you know there's no market makers so that absolute rate is at a certain price you could put some cheeky bids in the market and maybe you pick up some at a slightly better price and that of course boosts your, your yield at the same time some of them have incredibly low liquidity. So be careful. Watch out for the liquidity. There is a preference share ETF issued by Core Shares. Uh, historic yield, 10.85. That's over the last 12 months and before dividend withholding tax. Code prefix. Uh, the ETF can, of course, go in tax-free. The preference shares individually cannot. Um, and there you can see their key holdings, the Standard Banks, the First Rand, Absys, Ned, Investec. So high quality. I mean, very, very high quality here. And Victor's, you know, then you're starting to get to sort of, I don't want to say low quality, but let's call them your B grade, so to speak. You know, the B class as opposed to the A class. Um, but there's some chunky yields there. Uh, the Invicta is not on this list, which is curious because the Invicta at one point was uh, floating closer to 13%. Maybe that rate has come down a bunch. Um, so there is a, an option here. And as I said, this can go in a tax-free account because these are paid as dividends. So you've got to slice 20% off for dividend withholding tax. Listed property. So part of the problem of low rates was in, you know, a year ago when we thought 9 or 10% was a low prime rate, uh, listed property. But listed property has had a horror, horror, horror couple of years. Uh, there is the index, the listed property index, the SAPI, SAPY. Uh, this goes back to uh, 2004. And the current price is at 2006 levels. Yields have collapsed. And I, you know, I, I didn't, I, I toyed with the idea of going and having a look-see. But truthfully, if you're interested in maybe getting up some property, rather go and look at the 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 the, the October power hour, which was Keelan and Gluvu from Stanlib, and he did the one on property. You'll find that at justonelap.com uh, slash power hour. The link will be there. You can go, you can find that video. He delves into it. He's the expert here. I just, we've got some quality here, but some of the quality is under pressure. Remember that they have to pay 75% of their distributable, distributable earnings as dividend. Um, otherwise, they lose their REIT status, and their REIT status means they don't pay tax. We take dividends that we earn from listed property, and we pay tax on it at our income tax rate. To me, this is just a sector. I hold a couple of ETFs here. My preferred is the Satrix Pro, STXPRO, or the CoreShares Prop, CSPROP, are my two preferred. But... If you're looking for income and you want some level of security, I don't think, you know, property, yeah, you know, and maybe this is the bottom. Maybe my making these comments, property now never looks back and has a heyday. But property's had a, a horror 
2020. And I'm not sure it gets better in the next year or two. I think we could see some another horror year or two from the property space. So I, I took the easy route here and just passed on property. Listed equity generally, this is a scan from this afternoon, and there are a couple of points that I want to make out here. Um, this is yield after dividend withholding tax. So this is after your tax, but it is historic. For example, City Lodge. That yield on City Lodge looks massively attractive. Problem is quite very, very simple, right? Uh, City Lodge is not paying dividends anytime soon because they almost went bankrupt. They had to do a 1.2 billion rand rights issue. So this is the dividend that they paid historically. I'm trying to think. It would have been for year in Feb, I suppose. Um, that is still filtering through, and they're not going to pay a dividend anytime soon. Uh, Hoskins, uh, share price has collapsed, but their big holdings are Soho Sun. Down at the bottom here, the Soho Sun going to be paying dividends. I am not so sure. So there's a lot here. There's your first property as a mass real estate. But, so we need to do some digging. Coronation, I quite like Coronation. 7.5% dividend yield. Uh, their latest, largest trading update said we could probably expect that to maybe pop up 10%. Take us to call it 8.3%, 8.4% dividend yield. Uh, Truers, yeah, uh, of course, Nedbank, uh, the, the, the prefs again, the ABSA prefs. Here, of course, what you have, as always, is you have risk of capital loss and you have risk of dividend loss. So these are not a simple walk in the park. And in some cases, those dividends have already disappeared. So do not just take this list and say, ah, City Lodge, 11.2, I'll have me some of that. No, 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 because you're not getting dividends from City Lodge for some time. There are some here. I mean, obviously the prefs, I'll ignore those for now. Um, but as I said, I mean, Coronation jumps out at me. One that didn't make the list, um, oh, I'll come to that in a sec. Uh, banks generally are very cheap uh, and decent yields. Again, historic <clears throat> capital at risk, but the South African Reserve Bank Prudential Authority requested that banks halt dividend payments, which they all did for their results in February, uh, June, and August as they came through. February and August was Capitec. June was uh, the big four. I don't know when they resume, and I can't find that information out. And In fact, I've read the letter from the Prudential Authority, and they don't say when to resume. I think some banks more than others, I think First Rand and Standard Bank could probably resume in 2021. In other words, they're the year end 2020, the results will be in March, dividends will be late March, early April. They could well resume at that point. I simply don't know and I can't find any clarity. Um, but banks currently are cheap and when the dividends come back, those yields will be attractive. But you're taking some risk that we don't see that coming through, uh, that, that dividends take longer to, take, to come through. It's also you're taking risk that, that we get second waves of the pandemic um, and that the bad debts, which the banks have provisioned for, the bad debts weren't enough. And that gets all sorts of, 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 of issues. Yeah, so there are some, you're going to get, uh, Adam's pointing out, uh, process double taxation, uh, uh, Richmond, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some where those, those yields, although both of those have massively tiny yields anyway. And Tombi, how long is likely to give in the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that prime rates, uh, are st I think our prime is probably going to stay at these levels for probably at least another year and a half. Truthfully, I think maybe as long as two to three years. Um, but then there's also, for example, British American Tobacco. So I didn't make my list because it was just off the bottom. So that's a 6.1% yield. You've got 20% dividend withholding tax on it. It's a sterling yield. So you've got some, it's paid in sterling. It's declared in sterling, converted into czar. So you've got some currency hedge there at the same time. And British American Tobacco's dividend is alarmingly fixed. I mean, they, they declared at the beginning of the year, they declare their entire year dividend payments. They do four a year and they declare them. They're like, no, no. Like, yeah, this is tobacco, man. We know how much we're going to sell. We know how much we're going to make. And sure, during hard lockdown, we couldn't buy tobacco products in South Africa, but the rest of the world could. Um, so what you've got with British American tobacco, there might be capital loss, but your dividend is fairly safe. I'm not going to say totally safe. I'm never going to say that. 
your dividend's fairly safe in that sense. So certainly a potentially a, a attractive there if you can stomach the, 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 the volatility of the share price as it moves around. Um, yeah, <clears throat> so my two equities would be Coronation and uh, British American Tobacco, and then a good hard look at some preference shares in that space there. We've got endowments, we've got participation bonds. I, I mentioned these because a couple of people have asked me about them. Outfest, uh, uh, Fed Group, but you will notice asterisks against both of those rates. There are a lot of T's and C's. A lot. Um, the Outfest is a product I know fairly well. Basically, you need to be in the highest tax bracket, i.e. paying 45% tax, and you already need to be exceeding. You have to be earning more than the interest exemption, 23800 if you're under 65 uh, or 34500 if you're over 65. So there are a lot of T's and C's to those rates. Um, and on the surface, they're attractive. You're also taking counterparty risk because they're not exchange traded. So I put them there. Maybe worth investing, investigating, but make very sure that you understand those terms of conditions. Certainly, both Fed Group and Outfest are companies that I do not consider fly by night. So you could phone their call centers, and I'm confident that you would get a honest answer. Um, but make sure you understand those T's and C's. So to the end, and then we've got a bunch of questions I'll come to. There is income to be found, but it's tough. I do think that this low, low income rate, low interest rate environment is at least another two years. Maybe I'm wrong and it's only 18 months, but I think it's around for a while. And frankly, it could be longer. What's your risk? What's your terms? What's your fees where applicable? Um, as I said, I've ignored tax implications, but there certainly is, there's enough out there. You know, when I started putting this present, when I, when I put this, put, was starting to put the presentation together, I, I thought I was going to really struggle. I really thought that there wasn't going to be a heck of a lot. It turns out there is some yield out there. You know, some of it is ETF. Some of it is preference shares. Some of it is government bonds. I hunt around some, some money markets, understand this, the, the distinction. And if you find a very high uh, money market, uh, be careful of it because you know w there's something in that that product, that money market or that income fund that is enabling it to do the very much higher rate. So careful of it in that sense. But there is some yield out there. And what I think is perhaps the key point, perhaps, is it's not a one shot all. It's not necessarily where everything goes in here, we're in business. I think it's very much a case of, well, hang on a sec, you know, maybe we structure around a couple of different ways. We can do a bit here, we can do a bit there. And we sort of build it and structure it in a sense. Um, and there can be. But I think the other key point is that it's that lower for longer. I think lower for longer is is, is absolutely going to be uh, the, the the issue there in, in that sense. Um, yeah, Adam, the solar panels. I'm curious to know how they've done um, over over lockdown. I needed to have a, a look in, 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 into in, into that structure, but a bunch of folks have said that they've been paying around the eight to ten percent. Um, there's there's risks associated. I've just never dug into them a heck of a lot. Someone saying, "What about impact investing?" Uh, same sort of story. I, I, I you know. My my gut says to me, I like exchange traded, man. I'm always either exchange traded or government guaranteed. Those are my preferences. I don't invest anything off off exchange without guarantee, just because of those of those layers of protection. But there is some out there lurking, absolutely. Uh, question coming through: uh, Who are the best stockbrokers for uh, preference shares? So you can buy preference shares from any stockbrokers. It's Afri Focus. Uh, who have that report which they publish. Just go to afrifocus.coza. They publish the report every, uh, they update it monthly. So you'll find that every month on their, their uh, website where you can go and find some more details there. Yeah, a question coming through around offshore. If you've got money in Western Europe or North America in the bank, you're earning zero. I mean, you're just, you're earning zero. There's just no money there at absolutely whatsoever. Uh, what about leaving the money in your stockbroker account? Sure. I mean, it, I mean, check what the rate is. Um, and again, those rates, and it's a question, you know, I keep on saying sort of maybe spread it around a bit, but there's also, you know, sometimes banks will say, well, for 10 grand, I'll give you 5%. But at 25 grand, I'll give you five and a half percent. So sometimes it's worth sort of bulking up to take that slightly better rate. And certainly in the in the 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 um, uh, 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 
the markets, you'll find that you know, as you as you push higher and you leave it in your stock broker account, as you push higher, you will get a slightly better rate. But they're still they round about the the four and a half to five and a half to maybe six percent. In other words, they're largely compatible with uh, uh, sort of normal levels that you get at your bank. Uh, yes, presentation is recorded. It will be available uh, just one lap dot com. Uh, slash power hour or just one lap.com it'll be on the home page that it'll be up later this evening um, in a couple of hours certainly by the time you wake up tomorrow morning unless you are a deeply early riser uh, it'll be up tomorrow morning so it'll be online you can grab it uh, it will be on the YouTube channels as well ladies and gents I'm not seeing any more questions come through so let's leave that there. Uh, as I said up front, there are two more events coming through for our power hours. In two weeks' time, 20 years of ETFs. The first ETF was listed on the JSC 27 November 2000. So we'll be looking back on ETFs in South Africa, ETFs globally, uh, and the like. Um, and then 3rd of December is position your portfolio for 2021. It's always our last year-end event. Uh, I present it. And what I do is, I first of all, I go and mark my previous year's predictions, and I've had a fairly good track record, but 2020, like no one saw a pandemic. So we'll see how I do. I haven't even yet peaked, so I don't know how I'll do. Um, so I go have a look at that. And then, of course, the other issue, uh, the, so the other point is I then look forward to what we can expect for the year ahead. Um, contact details, Twitter accounts. Uh, you can mail me, Simon, at just one lap .com if you've got further questions uh, twitters and the like also are available um, and then of course legal disclaimers ladies and gents thanks very much for your time this evening we're finishing almost spot on everyone uh, i'm going to say drive safe but we're probably at home so stay safe have a good evening and we'll see you again in two two weeks cheers all